Greetings. My name is Terry Covey and I'm the pastor of Twin Oaks Baptist Church. This message that you are about to hear was delivered at Twin Oaks. We pray that it will be a blessing to you and if there are any questions that you may have or any way that we may be of help to you, please feel free to contact us. God bless you and have a great day. Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Hebrews, please. Hebrews chapter 4, we'll start out there this morning. Uh, music has had a message already today about the love of God and when we're hurting and when we need someone to be with us and give us strength, console us, and our Prince of Peace and all of those wonderful things. And, and we, do, we do, indeed, we do need that, don't we? We need, we need a Savior who understands. We need someone who who cares about us, and what a wonderful, wonderful thing that is. And as I've been studying, we're working and preparing our heart. We're following along through what is often called the Passion Week of Christ. You know that sometimes we as a church, we, we do what we call a Passion Play. Several years ago, we saw, many of us saw a film that was called The Passion of the Christ. And so why do we often associate that word Passion with, with Easter? Well, actually the word Passion there that the, when it's a reference to Christ, it's speaking of his sufferings. It's speaking of all that Jesus went through there. Matter of fact, in Acts chapter 1 verse 3, when the King James translators were translating the Bible into English, they actually, in that one verse, they translated the word suffer as passion. Christ, after he had entered into his passion. And what it means by that is that Christ, after Christ went through all the suffering that he went through for us. And the Bible teaches us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. This passage I refer to often, but it says in verse 14, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession or our faith in him. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted or tested like as we are yet without sin. That's an amazing thing to me to think about the fact that Jesus was willing to come to this earth and to endure the suffering, not only the cross. Yes, we know that the climax of his suffering was there on the cross, but the Bible says that Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And so I don't know if Jesus ever laughed. I pray that while he was here on earth, I pray that there were times when it caused Jesus to chuckle or to laugh. The Bible never uses the word laughter with Jesus. But the Bible uses the word weeping and sorrow often with Jesus. And so Jesus understands when we go through very difficult times in life, and each of us, many of you stood this morning, of a special need in your life. And if you're either someone who needs prayer or you're praying for someone who needs the prayer. We're all going through this, this life. We go through many, many difficult times. And so it's good to know that God, the God who created this universe, the God who was able to just speak everything into existence actually cares. He actually wants to be involved in our life. I believe that God wants a far more intimate relationship with us than we can even imagine. He wants a very close, personal. Jesus told his disciples, he said, I no longer call you servants, I'm now calling you my friends. When Jesus went to the garden there to, as we'll study in another message, as he went to the garden there to pray before the cross, what did he ask? He asked three of his closest friends to come and to be with him. And so Jesus, I believe, loves our friendship. And Jesus wants to be a friend to us. He wants to be this good shepherd, this comforting, comforting shepherd and savior to us. For many years, uh, I did not see God in that kind of way. For many years, I saw God as just someone who was very stoic, if you know what I mean. God did not have any emotions, what I thought. For many years, I just envisioned God just sitting there upon the throne. I don't mean to be, I'm not trying to be irreverent here, but I just envisioned God as just this old, white hair, long beard, white beard, you know, with a white robe on, sitting on His throne going for all eternity. And I think what really opened up my eyes, and I gained a different perspective of God, is when I one day I was reading the story of the prodigal son, and suddenly it dawned on me that the father in that story is, is God the father. And the prodigal son, we're the prodigal son. God, the people that God made, his creation, 
We're, the prod- we're all have been the prodigal son or the prodigal daughter. And God the Father is the God, the Father in that story. And Jesus, when he was telling the story, said this. Let me read t- something to you from that. He says, and when he, that is the Father, when, excuse me, when the Son was a great way off, his Father saw him and had compassion. And as Jesus was trying to, to illustrate his Father, he says he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And Jesus, I think, was trying to emphasize the Father, the, the love that he had. His son had rebelled against him, and his son was away from him. And no doubt, the Bible says when the son was still a great ways off, the father could see him, which meant what? The father had been watching, I guess, probably every day, as we would. Many of you, you have children that are, that have, been, that are or have been rebellious. And even as it breaks your heart, that's what... Jesus was trying to illustrate here that it broke the heart of, of God the Father. It broke the heart of this Father in this story of the prodigal son, and it breaks the heart of God the Father when his children are away from him. So if you're praying and you're suffering over a child that is in rebellion, you need to understand that God understands. And God prays along with you. Jesus intercedes along with you. He is just as concerned as you are. And then Jesus said this as he was telling this story. He said, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. We always say that the angels rejoice when someone is saved. Actually, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says there is joy in the presence of the angels. Which means what? The angels witness the joy. Who was the one that got excited in that story? The servants? No, the father. And the Bible says that every time somebody accepts Jesus as their personal Savior to God the Father, it is like that prodigal son. It is, we've all been created in His image. The person who, who claims to be the greatest atheist breaks the heart of God. That they won't come because God made that individual in His image. God created that person for, for pleasure, for His own pleasure, for a relationship with that individual. And the Bible says every time someone makes that decision to come to God and to receive Jesus as their Savior, the Bible says that God rejoices. Isn't it great to know? God expresses emotions in many, many ways. Let me read to you something else, a passage I often refer to out of the book of 2 Corinthians. Paul says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation or our trials so that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. It's good to know that when we're hurting, maybe, maybe it is the death of a loved one or maybe it is some other sorrow in our life. We're going through this great time of agony and pain in our life. Listen, God wants to comfort us. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says, He doesn't sit there indifferent, calloused, the Bible says God wants to reach out to us and He wants to be that, that close, intimate friend with us to bring comfort and peace into our heart. Another verse of Scripture that I often look to for encouragement. It says, Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear Him. My daughters, listen, my daughters could call me right now and say that I need you, Dad. And I don't know what you'd do for the rest of the service. You know what I mean? And you do the same thing for your children. And that's natural. That's good that we love our children in that kind of way. Listen, the Bible says, like as we pity our children, like as we want to reach out with mercy and compassion to our children, the Bible says, so the Lord pities them that fears Him. So God is a God who feels, and our Savior is a Savior who feels as well. Matter of fact, during this Passion Week of Christ, if you turn to the Gospel of Matthew, with me. We're going to study from Matthew 21 today. During this week of passion that we often speak of, of the suffering of Christ, Jesus experienced a variety of emotions. He experienced what it meant, what it feels like to be sad. He experienced what it feels like to be glad. He even experienced what it feels like to be mad. First of all, a Savior who understands what it is to be sad. It says, look at, you know, at Matthew 23, go over chapter, I mean, 21. Go over to chapter 23 real quickly. Let me show you something there from that passage. This was the heart of Jesus during that week of passion. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. Jesus apparently stood off somewhere to the side, and and I'm not sure exactly where he was at this moment, but it says in verse 37, Jesus is crying out to the Israel. 
He's saying, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often when I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gather her chickens under her wings, and you would not. What's that verse saying to us? That verse is saying that Jesus, he looked, he looked at the Jewish people, and he looked at their rebellion against him, and it broke his heart to see the fact that they would not turn to him. They would not come to him. Matter of fact, Luke's gospel said this. When Jesus, right after he made his triumphal entry, as he was making his triumphal entry, it's the gospel of Luke says this, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. While all this crowd, we studied about the triumphal entry last week, and while all the crowd was, was cheering and shouting, Hosanna, and going through all of this, the Bible says that at some point, Jesus looked upon the city of Jerusalem, and the Bible says that he wept, and the word that is used there means more than just a tear trickled out of his eye. It means that he burst forth in tears. He was overcome with emotion there, and he just started weeping as he was riding in on that donkey into Jerusalem. Why? Well, because he was broken over the fact that they were lost, that they would not come to him. Jesus suffered spiritually during that week of passion. And again, I would say to those of you who, who weep over lost loved ones, maybe it's a child that doesn't know the Lord, maybe it's a parent who doesn't know the Lord, a brother or a sister or whoever it might be. Let me read to you a verse out of the book of Psalms. He that goeth forth and weepeth, Bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You'll know something. It is a good thing to weep over the salvation of other people. Probably there's no time that we're more like our Savior than when our heart is actually broken over the spiritual condition of someone else. And I know that many of you carry a burden for spiritual condition of your friends, your loved ones, your family. I carry, Pastor Zach I know carries, as pastors, that's part of our calling into the ministry, we carry a, a heavy burden in our heart. I remember one time up in Ohio, this lady came to me, and, and before, well, I've been, a lot of times I would go outside of the church where it was there, if it was a pretty day, and I would kind of walk out over the field there, I'd always get early to the church, and they saw me one day, and they kind of waved, and they came in the parking lot, and she said, she said, you know, forgive me for saying this, but she said, you look like this morning like you had the weight of the world on your shoulders. And I thought, well, yeah, because my heart breaks for people. It would be my desire that every person that's a member of this church, every person that ever enters the door of this church, it is, I live for the fact of your close relationship with God. That's what my life is really pretty much totally I probably give 60 or 70% of my week, every week, to this church, to this body of believers, to this community. I carry that burden. And I know that you carry a burden. And listen, when we carry that burden for the lost, when we carry a spiritual burden, when we suffer spiritually, and really I don't know that we can really intercede for people in prayer until we suffer spiritually for them. I remember a friend that we had in Ohio one time, and her husband left her and moved in with another woman. And rather than just becoming angry over this, and I'm sure that she was hurt, I'm sure there were moments of anger, but she went to fasting. And she spent two or three weeks in fasting and praying for her husband. He came home. I'm not going to say that's going to happen every time, but, but it's a good thing to, you know what I'm saying, to suffer spiritually for people. That's really intercessory prayer. And Jesus understands what it is to be sad, to suffer spiritually. Not only that, Jesus understands what, obviously what it's like to suffer physically. We know about the crucifixion. We'll study more about that later. But let me read to you just one verse out of the book of Isaiah. It says in the book of Isaiah, many were appalled at him because he was so disfigured that he didn't even see, seem to be human. And simply no longer look like a man. I know this sounds kind of silly, but uh, which I, I go to the greatest dentist in all the world, Tony. Especially, you know, and I, I don't have the greatest teeth in all the world, so it's good to have the greatest dentist, you know. Because every once in a while, he's got to do a little work on my teeth. And, oh, don't you hate it when they pull out that syringe, you know. But I really never feel it. You know, he is so good with that. But I tell you, I know it sounds silly, but you know what I think a lot of times when they get ready to put that needle in my mouth? 
Oh Lord, I know that you've suffered on the cross. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I know I can bear this. Listen, friends, when we go through physical suffering, when we go through those moments and I think about people, every time I hear someone who has cancer or something like that and I think about the physical suffering, I think about the nausea. Some people have never thrown up in their whole life. If I even think about it long enough, I'll get, I'll do it. And I think about that, that nausea. And I think about what people, and it breaks my heart of what they go through. Do you know it's good to know that Jesus understands? He understands the physical suffering. He's a companion with them during that time of physical suffering. But the Bible teaches us there's another way that Jesus un- that suffered that week. Perhaps it's a way that we don't often think about. Jesus suffered spiritually and he suffered physically, but Jesus also, also suffered emotionally. Sometimes emotional suffering is some of the greatest suffering that we can endure. And it says again in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says that he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. What does that mean? It means that, as best I can understand, that actually when we suffer, whether it's spiritually or physically or emotionally, whenever we suffer in some kind of way, listen, the Bible says that Jesus suffers along with us. It's not just that he thinks back, oh yeah, I remember going through that. The tense of the verbs and the way that it's written there in the book of Hebrews seems to indicate that as we... Isn't that amazing? For 2,000 years, Jesus has been suffering for His church. He suffers along with us. He feels that kind of pain as we feel that kind of pain. And so therefore, when He prays for us, when He intercedes for us, He truly intercedes with a heart of love. Jesus understands. He understands what it's like to be sad. But here's something else amazing about Jesus. Verse 12 of Matthew 21. And Jesus went into the temple of God. This is on the evening of when he wrote in the triumphal entry. Jesus went into the temple of God and then he cast out all that sold and bought bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seed of them that sold doves. And he said unto them, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Jesus understands what it's like to be sad. Jesus understands what it's like to be mad. Sometimes we think of mad, somebody being mad, we think always of mad or anger just as being sinful. And we know that anger can be sinful. But not all anger is sinful. The Bible says in Hebrews, or excuse me, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, Be ye angry and sin not. If someone broke into my house, and if someone harmed my wife, or someone harmed my children, do you think that would make me mad? That would make me very mad, as it would make you very, very mad. It would make you angry for them to do that. And it would not be wrong for me to be mad over that if something was wrong. What it would be wrong for me to get a gun and then try to retaliate against, get revenge against that person. The Bible says, be ye angry, yet sin not. So there is, there is what the Bible often, well, the Bible doesn't use the term, but we use this term to explain it, righteous indignation. I'm sure you've heard that before. What is righteous indignation? Well, the word indignation means wrath or anger. Righteous. There can be a righteous kind of anger. Matter of fact, most of the time that the word anger is used in the Bible, it's used in reference to God. God gets angry over things. What does God get angry over? Well, this phrase, righteous indignation, refers to any time there's a sense of something that is a mistreatment or an injustice. God gets angry over that. I get angry over our country at times. I'm sure you do as well. I get angry over the things that sometimes you turn on the television and you see. I get angry at what's going on, all this craziness. And it's, it's right because there's a sense within me that sees that this is wrong, this is an injustice, this is, this is unlawful for this to be this way. And so it makes us angry. And listen, when Jesus went into the temple that day, and when he saw what they were doing in the house of God, the Bible says it made Jesus mad. It made him angry. Matter of fact, John says this, he made a whip of small cords and he drove them, that is the animals, out of the temple. Why would Christ do? Why would, it's hard for us to think about Jesus ever getting mad. Well, let me tell you a couple of reasons why Jesus got mad that day. Number one, he was 
there was madness or there was anger over their actions. The Bible tells us there were actually two groups of people in the temple. One, there were the money changers, and then there were those who sold the doves. What is that talking about? Well, the common everyday currency in, in the days of Jesus would have been a Roman coin. And when you went to the temple, you were to give an offering to God, but you could not give an offering with a Roman coin. You had to have a, a shekel, a Jewish shekel, which is another form of currency. And so there were people there that actually had set up these booths, had set up these places, and they would exchange the currency. As a matter of fact, it says in the book of Exodus, I just read here recently, it says in the book of Exodus that they were to do that. It says in the book of Exodus, this was part of God's will, that one, if you have these other types of currency, you need to exchange it for this temple currency. Secondly, if you lived, you're coming to the Passover. You're to offer an offering, an animal offering there. Well, if you live, let's say you lived 100 miles away, that would have pretty been a pretty long trip, wouldn't it, to try to transport an animal that far. So what you could do is you could actually go there somewhere and you could buy an animal. You could buy a sacrificial animal to offer. And so that part of it wasn't wrong, but part of what was wrong was this, is that these men that were doing this, they were ex extracting these exuberant prices. It was extortions, what it was. They were charging way over what they should have been charging. Let, let me rephrase it so that we'll understand it. They were using the things of God for personal gain. You know, I, let me get on a tangent just for a second. I get angry. I get mad over this religious entertainment industry in America today. I believe that if somebody sings or somebody does something, I believe that they're worthy of, of, of being compensated for that. Paul says, you know, muzzle not the mouth of the oxen that treadeth out the corn. And so there's nothing wrong with that. But what is wrong, what is wrong is trying to use the things of God for personal gain. To try to rob people. And so what Jesus, Jesus, think about this. Jesus calls the temple what? He calls it my father's house. So Jesus is, I, I misspoke a moment ago. Jesus did this the morning after that he entered into Jerusalem. What he did was, he rode into Jerusalem that day. He wept over the city. It was toward the evening. He went into the temple and he looked around to see what was happening. And then he went back that night to the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And the Bible says early the next morning. And I looked at that word early in the morning and tried to study it. And it meant sometime before 6 a.m. That's early. Which means what? Jesus was very upset. He was extremely troubled over this. How, what these men were doing. How they were this extortion that was going on here in the temple. He was angry over their irreverence for what is holy. And so Jesus drove them out. But it wasn't just their actions. I believe also that Jesus was actually angry over their attitude. It says in Isaiah chapter 56, Jesus actually is quoting from there. He says, For mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. When Herod the Great rebuilt the temple, and Herod, Herod wasn't a Christian man. Herod the Great wasn't. He wasn't a godly man. But Herod was a... a political, savvy kind of man. And the temple itself was built on the top of Mount Moriah. And so it was built upon a peak, and it was a steep drop-off all around the temple. And hundreds of thousands of Jews would come there and be around the temple. And so it really wasn't a good place. For, I mean, it wasn't actually physically feasible for the people to come there. So Herod the Great did something. He built what we often call the Temple Mount. He built this structure that was several football fields in length. It was a huge, several acre structure. One wall on that structure was 600 feet high. That's how many stories, you know? Today, you hear about Jews going to the Wailing Wall. You know what the Wailing Wall is? The Wailing Wall is the only part of that temple that's left. It's part of the wall, the reinforcement wall against the embankment so that Herod could, Herod could build this huge flat structure that where several thousand people could gather. The temple itself was just a very small part right in the very middle of it, but then there was this huge flat area that Herod had built up. It was so big that there were rooms underneath it. In the days of Jesus, there were four different parts to the temple. 
It was called the court of the, of the priest. And only the priest could enter into that part of the temple. Outside of the court, the court of the priest was a very central part of the temple. Outside of the court of the priest would be called the court of Israel. And there, if you were not a priest, you were just a Jewish man, you could come into that part. Outside of that part was called the court of the women. And if you were a Jewish woman, you could come that close to that part. And outside of that was called the court of the Gentiles. And this was the part, this was this big flat stone structure that Herod had built for all the people. It was called the court of the Gentiles. If you were not a Jewish person, if you were a Gentile person, you could not, not go any further than the court of the Gentiles. Matter of fact, they had a sign up that said that a Gentile may not pass beyond this point except by death. They'd kill you if you were a Gentile. You'd enter in to the rest of the temple area. But a Gentile person could come into this, this massive flat area there and worship God. And this was where they were, had the money changers. This is where they were set up. I want, you, I, want, I want you to plug in on something here. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. What was Jesus, what was God saying there? Does God just love the Jew? No. God loved the Gentile as well. And what angered Jesus was the fact that that this one area where the Gentile could come and maybe draw close to God and could find God, this one area, the Jewish people had become so calloused in their heart, they had become so self-centered in their religion, that they had turned this into a flea market. And they didn't even care that Gentile people couldn't come. Here the other day, somebody made mention to me, and it's kind of interesting, then over the last month or two, something they, some of the diversity that is if you know what I'm talking about that's happening here at Twin Oaks and somebody said it surprised me somebody hasn't said something you better not say it to me because God loves all people amen that's a lesson we need to learn in this world and it's good to hear your amens to this so Jesus Jesus understands what it's like to be sad. And Jesus understands what it's like to be mad. There are things that happen in life. I'm sure that some of you, there's something that's happened in your life. Or maybe it's going on now and there's an injustice. There's a mistreatment. There's something that's just wrong. And you know that it's wrong. And in your heart, there's a madness. There's an anger. That, that anger is not necessarily wrong. It could be wrong how you react with it, what you do with it. But when there's an injustice, when there's something that's wrong... Jesus understands that. And I would encourage you, sometimes I get mad. Do you ever get mad? Sometimes, I know you do, Pansy, so go ahead and, no, I'm, I do. I get mad. I do too. I get mad. And what I've learned to do when I get mad, I go to the Lord in prayer. I ask the Lord to help me to deal with my anger. Help me to deal with this situation, whatever it might be. But lastly, we have a Savior who understands what it's like also to be glad. We have a happy Savior. Verse 21, verse four, or verse 14 of Matthew 21. After Jesus has cleansed the, cleansed the temple, notice what the Bible says. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Once Jesus had purged the temple area of all of the impurity of what was going on, then those that he had come to save and to seek, those who really had an open heart and needed him, the Bible says they came into the temple and he began to heal them. I, here's what I imagine. I don't know if this has happened, but Jesus drives them out and they're picking, then the money changers and the people, they're picking up their stuff and they're, they're, work, they're working their way out and they're leaving and probably at that point, maybe Jesus has got a frown on his face. But then he looks over and he sees a very poor person or a very sick person and probably that frown turned into a smile. And Jesus said, oh, it's okay. You are welcome in my Father's house. I mean, what a blessed time. Kind of puts chill bumps on me to think about. What a, what a refreshing time that must have been for Jesus when these hungry people came to him. Friday night, several of us had an opportunity to go to a Phillips Craig and Dean concert. And uh, I noticed there, and I kind of sat over there to the side a little bit on myself, and because I... I love you all that went, but I just, want, I just want to be me and God there for a while. 
And so, you know, it took a few songs for my heart to get soft, you know, again, to where it wanted to be, it needed to be, to worship. And, and I really started worshiping some of the songs uh, that we, they sang that night. It was so, so powerful. And so I was standing, I'll be honest with you, I'm standing there like this, and I don't care if anybody's looking or not, you know, and I'm worshiping God. And then I looked around and I saw people everywhere doing that, and I thought, there are people hungry for God. Last night, uh, Tammy and her brother, Mike, came back for a while and uh, to kind of refresh. They've been up there since Wednesday with her mom. And so last night I met them in Roanoke and I brought Tammy back and we were, she was just, you know, telling me a week's worth of stuff there on the way home. And, and then we were talking about this and she said, well, she said, how did your week go? You know, she said, how, did that, how was the concert? And I thought, I said, there are people that are hungry for God. You know what Tammy said? She said, there are people that are hungry for the goodness of God. I thought, isn't that wonderful? Yeah. People hungry for the goodness of God. And what a blessing. I'm sorry, but i got chill bumps on me to think about. What a blessing it must have been for Jesus after this moment of anger, having to deal with all this callousness, to turn around and to see these people with just nothing, broken with nothing, Coming to him. And the Bible says, Luke's gospel says this, he taught him daily in the temple. Once he got the temple prepared where he could minister, the Bible says Jesus then just focused on ministering to them, to those people. I'm sure it was gladness to Jesus when he was able to teach in the temple. But not only did the teaching in the temple bring him gladness, I'm going to say also the tenderness of the children. Look at verse 15. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, healing people, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. The word there for children means very small children. They, the priest, were displeased. And they said unto him, Hearest thou not what these say? Jesus said unto them, Hey, have you never read? Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. That's in Psalm 8.2. I studied Psalm 8.2 this week. What it seems to say is that God was the one who put that children's choir together that day to come and sing to Jesus. Some people say that it would be the children of those that Jesus was healing. Some people would say it was the children of, of the pilgrims who had been traveling in with Jesus on this the triumphal entry. They had heard their parents singing it. I don't know who the children, who they were. But what a blessing it must have been to Jesus to hear these children singing in this innocency, in this simplicity, singing to God. You know, the Bible doesn't say that a child has to become like an adult for God. The Bible says adults have to become like children to please God. As a matter of fact, oftentimes, Jesus, when he talks about the little ones, what seems to happen is that Jesus starts out with a little child and using a little child as an illustration, as a little child, and then he starts talking about little ones, and the phrase there, little ones, doesn't necessarily mean children. It means adults with childlike faith. So I want to say to you this week, as you're working and preparing your heart for Easter, as you spend over the next few weeks in your relationship with God, just be childlike in your relationship with God. Be open and honest and sincere with Him. I, I am still amazed that God wants to be close to me. I'm amazed that in the middle of the night that I can have God's undivided attention and just talk with Him as one person, the Bible says, as a man would talk with his friend, to be able to talk with God that way. There's one last thing I believe that brought Jesus gladness, and he understands what it's like to be glad, and because he was able to spend some time actually with his friends. Look at John chapter 12. Flip over there quickly to the Gospel of John. And John records something that happened that I believe was very, very special to Jesus, and I believe it's something that we can learn from in John chapter 12. This actually happened on 
the Saturday night before the triumphal entry. John chapter 12, verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been raised from the dead, excuse me, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. And there they made him a supper. I believe that probably Mary, Martha, and Lazarus loved Jesus as much or maybe more than anyone else. And I don't believe that Jesus had favorites. But I'm sure that probably Jesus was drawn to them more than anyone else. You know, there's, there's some people that you just like to be around, don't you? There's some people that will just, you know, Adrian Rogers used to say, there's some people who will brighten a room when they leave it. But there are other people, you'll figure that out in a minute, but there are other people that you just love to be around. You love that relationship, that fellowship with them. And I believe that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were three of the people that Jesus actually loved to be around. And what the Bible seems to indicate is during that Passion Week, Jesus would go into Jerusalem and he would minister there into Jerusalem. But somewhere around sunset, he would travel back to Bethany, which was only a couple of miles away. He would travel back to Bethany and he spent each night in the early part of the week in the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Actually, when they have this supper, he's in the home of another man by the name of Simon, who the Bible says once was a leper. And so Jesus, think about this. Jesus is getting ready to enter in to the the most difficult week of his entire life. His week of passion, his week of suffering. And in order to help prepare himself for that, And in order to continually refresh himself and to find the strength that he needed to do what he was going to have to do that week, listen, Jesus would go and be with his close friends. I would love to think that if I had been living there in that day and time, that Jesus would want to come and spend some time in my home. I would love to think that I had a close enough relationship with the Lord that that He would feel welcome in my home. Think about this. That the Savior would find refreshment in going and being with His friends. I would love to be that kind of friend with God. To give Him, not only get refreshment from Him, but to give refreshment to Him. You know... Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and Simon, they can teach us something about a relationship with God. Simon, the leper. Simon had been healed. Simon has... Why do you think Simon had Jesus into his home that night? I, here's what I imagine. Forgive me, I, I add a lot in my mind in the Bible. The man's been a leper most of his life. Doesn't even mention anything about his wife. So what do you think... What do you, kind of home do you think Simon, the, the leper, had? Probably wasn't the nicest home in the town, was it? Probably wasn't the cleanest home in the town. And here's what's an interesting thing. It says, at verse 2, and Martha served. What kind of woman was Martha? Do you think Martha's home was clean? Oh, great day. And so don't you imagine that it was probably pretty hard for Martha to be willing to go to that home and eat a meal? Simon, tell you what, Simon, let's just just have it in my home. Please, Martha, please. I know, but please, Martha, it would mean so much to me. You know, probably Martha realized that Jesus was probably more concerned about the cleanliness of the heart than he was the utensils. And, and here's what I, I would say that Simon would teach us about relationship with God. Gratitude. That's the word I wrote in my notes. Gratitude. I bet the man was just so... He's been a leper. And now he's healed. And probably so grateful. But then there's Martha. What would Martha teach us? The Bible says Martha served. We know that Martha was... You know, we often call it the Martha syndrome. 
Some of us have the problem with the Martha syndrome. You know what that is, don't you? You're, you know, Lord, get them to help me. The Martha syndrome. But the Bible says that Martha served that night. Do you think she was sinning in her serving? No. I think probably Martha had a change of heart. The Bible says, serve the Lord with gladness. The Bible doesn't say don't serve the Lord. The Bible says serve the Lord. But just do it with the right attitude. And so probably that night, rather than being, you know, the person that had to have everything exactly in order, I would imagine Martha that night was a servant. Lazarus, the Bible says, Lazarus sat at the table. Why Lazarus? Why is that so important? What had Jesus done just previously for Lazarus? Raised him from the dead. The Bible, listen, the Bible says that when Jesus was making that triumphal entry, Part of the multitude that was traveling with Jesus into the city that day was those that had come to the home of Lazarus to actually see, is he actually... Do you mean, tell me you were dead? Really? Dead? And you're alive? And the Bible says many of the Jews believed on Jesus after they saw what he had done for Lazarus. What's Lazarus? Lazarus is a testimony. Then the last person. I need to end this, don't I? Verse 3. Mary. I, don't, I imagine Mary is probably a teenage, teenager. Then Mary took a pound of ointment, a spikener, very costly. It was a year's wages. Here's what I've often imagined. It was her dowry. It was her future. She took this pound of ointment, a spikener, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped them with her hair. Warren Wiersbe says every time you'll look for Mary, you know where you'll find her? At the feet of Jesus. And matter of fact, the Bible says that it filled the house with the, the fragrance, the odor, the fragrance of the ointment and Judas is going to criticize her for it and Jesus says she's anointed me for my burial. Mary was probably the only one who really understood what was going to happen. She might have been the youngest in the entire bunch, that she understood what was about to happen. Why did Mary understand? Because she spent a lot of time at the feet of Jesus, worshiping Him. A lot of you are going through difficult times in your life. You're going through, I don't know what it might be. It might be a time of sadness. It might be a time of madness. Or if you're at a point now where you can enjoy gladness, I would encourage you in your relationship with God to draw close to Him wherever you're at. Learn this as we study about Jesus in this week of passion. Take these principles and apply them to your life. And I trust that the Holy Spirit will do that this morning. Let me read to you once again from the book of Hebrews. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our faith. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our weaknesses, but was in all points tested like as we are yet without sin. And listen, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may, may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. you know what the word boldly there means? Openly and frankly. The Bible says that we're whatever it is that we're going through life, whatever our need is, the Bible says that God invites us to come openly to Him. To be honest. How many of you have got a need today? Just curiosity. Raise your hand high. Just got a need. So I'm saying. The, Bible want God's, the Bible says God wants you to be open about it. Honest. To draw close. To let Him share with you and whatever the emotions are that you're going through at the time. Let Him share with you. To let Him be there closer. To let Him bring you comfort. To let Him bring you His mercy and His grace to give you the strength that you need for whatever it is that you're going through at this time.